Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. When we talk about our dreams, it's usually in the context of limitless possibilities. It's the one often private place where we're free of the constraints of reality, seemingly limited only by our imagination. Our dreams, we often believe, hold the key to how we see the future. But those dreams, like everything else, have a context. Our life experience and our social position, good or bad, race, gender, and status, all shape those dreams. It's an interesting irony that the dreams that we think move us to unlimited possibilities can often hold us back. We're going to explore all this today with my guests, Karen Cerullo and Janet Ruan. Karen Cerullo is a professor of sociology at Rutgers University and editor of Sociological Forum. Janet Ruan is a professor emerita of sociology at Montclair State University. Together, they're the authors of Dreams of a Lifetime, How Who We Are Shapes How We Imagine Our Future. Karen, Janet, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. I want to start talking about this idea that in many ways we think of dreams as limitless in terms of possibility, and yet, as you have found in your research, that they are shaped in large measure by our personal experience and our place in the world. Talk about that. Janet, start with you. Well, I, I... I love your summary of the book. I think you did a really nice job introducing us. And the idea that, yes, culture absolutely builds inequality into the dreaming process. And it contradicts two very popular notions that uh, we, we have our own personal, unique dreams, or on the other hand, that, that we have this universal American dream that, to, that we all buy into. And we found neither of those to, to really accurately capture what goes on when, when we dream. Our, what we call our social place, our social locations of age, gender, social class, even things like uh, dislocations, disruptions, illness, unemployment, uh, uh, appear to have remarkable impact on people's dreaming. Karen, do dreams have to have a basis, even within that cultural framework, does the basis have to be in personal experience, or can it come from a, a, a larger social and cultural framework? Well, what we found was that most dreams are not necessarily based on personal experience, that people grab on to cultural lessons that they've learned growing up, uh, being exposed um, to uh, general lessons in the society. And we really found that people pulled out what almost might seem like cliches, mm. that their dreams are based on ideas like opportunity is boundless or dream big or you know never give up on your dreams. Optimism makes everything possible. We also found that some people drew from negative lessons that are out there in the culture. The idea that the deck is stacked against people or that people who rise high often fall hard. So I think that our dreams in large measure are based on the lessons we learn depending on where we're standing, if you will, in the society. Are dreams essentially then a kind of reflection of our place in the culture? Janet? Well, yes, I think we can uh, give a certain qualified uh, agreement to that. Um, we do find similarities that seem to transcend place, such as the common themes we found running across the dreams of our over 200 respondents, we find some similarities in terms of people having a very personalized idea of dreams in that they're, they're the stars of their dreams. Uh, they seldom involve others. They are really individualistic is one way of putting it. People dream in great detail. So those are things that happen regardless of their place, but there are also some very interesting findings. Uh, Karen? Yeah, I, I wanted to jump here in, 
jump in here and, and just say that, um, you know, one of the things we looked at when we started this book is dreams being their own unique kind of beast. There's lots of literature among social scientists who study things like aspirations and goals, which tend to be you know, things that we plan for and we work toward. And lots of research on things like hope, which are still grounded in some real world experience. So, you know, you get a bad diagnosis, you hope to uh, get better. You fall in love, you hope you're going to have a wonderful long-term relationship. But dreams are their own unique beast. Um, They tell us something about where a person wants to belong, where they want to land, where life paths would take them if there were no obstacles. And so in that way, we felt They were very different from some of the things that we've looked at as social scientists in the past. Um, And they, they are really something about the essence of people, but nevertheless are still quite patterned depending on who you are in terms of class and race and gender and lifespan and so forth. And to what extent, Karen, are dreams about the future? Uh, They are always about the future. And I think one of the things that testifies to that is very often people are dreaming about the things that if we were to realistically assess the dream, we know that they have no chance of accomplishing. But because they're engaged in imagining the future, they can go to this place in their mind and feel as if there's always a chance that something like that might happen. What about, and, and both of you, start with you, Janet, the, the kind of imagined past, the degree to which dreams are also about what we wish the past might have been like? Well, I, I can't say that we were asking respondents for that connection. Instead, what we were doing is using variables like their social class, their education level, their, their um, ethnicity their gender, uh, but we were, we were really encouraging them to, to think about the future and then leaving it to us to see if there was this connection between their um, statuses that for the most part, many of them are there from, from early life, if not birth, and seeing just where they wind up in stating future possibilities. Karen? Yeah, I mean, I think there is some indication that people have thought about some of these things in the past. You know, I think of uh, an elderly gentleman who was in the sample whose dream was to become president of the United States. And he told me he developed that dream when he saw the Kennedy assassination on television. And it just inspired him to want to go into politics. Now, mind you, He never did. Uh, He was well into his late 60s. He did not have any realistic possibilities. He had not been politically active. He did not have funding. But he was sitting there telling us, I've thought about this almost all my life. And after all, Trump had no experience. Maybe that could happen to me. Um, So sometimes, yeah, there is a reaching into the past, but it's, it's less about regret It's less uh, a statement of, I wish if I had only taken this turn, my life would have turned out in a certain way. It's more about imagining what could be, regardless of whether it's a realistic imagining or not. And let me me add that if if indeed we saw some uh, regret or some pondering the past, it often was in the area of education. I wish I had stayed in high school or gotten that college degree or pursued my interest in medicine. And that, that kind of thing we would hear playing out. But, but that was often, yeah, in the realm of some educational background that they now understand would have been a, a great Uh, way of improving their chances of achieving their dreams. Karen, talk about the role that place plays in all of this beyond sort of social status, the the cultural mythology of a place, people dreaming in America versus people dreaming in China. I mean, talk about the, the relevance of that. 
Well, I, I have to guess at it here because we did have an American sample. But based on research I've done in the past, um, it would appear that Americans and many Western European countries um, really cling to the idea of optimism. And that makes dreaming uh, very satisfying and it makes it feel very uh, possible and realistic to people. Now, we're guessing at this point, we hope we'll be able to pursue this a little further, but we're, we're guessing that, for example, in certain Asian or African nations, that that culture of optimism is not as prevalent. And we might see some differences, some more balance in the way people think about past, present, and future than we do among Americans and other Western Europeans. Talk about that optimism and the way it, it, it shapes dreams, because one of the things you talk about is dreams which are obtainable, feasible, versus those that are more fantastic. Karen? Yeah. You know, a few years ago, I wrote another book called Never Saw It Coming, and that book was entirely about Americans uh, being unable to envision worst case scenarios. And that went for everyday Americans versus people who are actually trained to see and anticipate worst case scenarios. The culture of optimism in the United States is so powerful that people block the idea of bad things. They are blindly optimistic about the future. And um, we see that here in that even dreams that are feasible are not things that people are actively pursuing. It's just something that they think about that makes them feel happy, that makes them feel comforted, that makes them feel excited, but they aren't necessarily planning to achieve it. It is something that almost becomes a place that they can inhabit in their minds to feel uh, excited or intoxicated by what might be, and always holding on to that idea that it indeed might be. And, and I'd love to add something here about ahead. the idea of um, optimism and finding a good place, and also this idea of it, it perhaps transcending American culture. There was a recent interview done by a, a New York Times columnist with a soldier in Ukraine, and I was absolutely blown away by the fact that the soldier was asking the Times reporter endless questions about the Super Bowl. And then finally said, you know, in this, in the middle of a war, finally said, you know, it's my dream of making it to the American Super Bowl someday and, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to get there. I think, again, it's just powerful testimony to the comfort <laughs> that we all get from dreaming and why uh, almost every single respondent told us how essential it was to dream. Janet, to what extent does the idea that if you can dream it, it's somehow possible play into this? Well, I think that everybody, to a degree, embraces that idea. But what we see is that think it and you can achieve it is, again, something that's much more likely to those, happen to those in uh, favorable, advantaged social positions and locations. But, you know, I would just add that what you've just said, Jeff, is such a powerful lesson. You know, I'm, I'm going to quote Jiminy Cricket here. <laughs> when you wish upon a star makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart can dream will soon come true. And even people who at one level understand that their dreams of, uh, you know, and I'll just mention some of the dreams, starting a new railroad, levitating their body, brokering uh, peace in the Middle East, uh, creating economic uh, equality in the United States. They, they know at one level that these things are not going to be possible for them to accomplish. And yet they will tell us that they will never give up on that because that that lesson that when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are, things will come true, is still powerfully gripping people, uh, even though at some level they know it's a false promise. Do we find, Karen, and, and maybe there isn't enough research on this, that the dreams are somehow generational? The dreams, in a way, can get passed on. 
Yes, uh, a number of our, uh, a majority of our subjects felt that um, they would like to pass on their dream if they could not accomplish it. Sometimes they wanted to pass it on to a child. Uh, sometimes they felt if they could find someone to mentor, uh, that they would like to pass the dream on to that person. And sometimes they thought that the dream was big enough to sort of pass on to a community organization to execute a very you know philanthropic dream that while they may not be able to carry it out in their lifetime, somebody else might be able to work on it. So there is this sense that even though it's your dream, uh, the majority of people wanted to share that and pass it on if they couldn't accomplish it themselves. And, and again, I'm just going to jump in again and say those who said they wouldn't pass on their dreams were basically acknowledging that everyone is entitled to their own dreams. And so they, they didn't want to burden, for instance, their children with having to pick up the parents' dreams. But again, that was that was a minority position. Is there a sense, Janet, that, that people triage dreams, that they have dreams that somehow are more important than others, that, that move to the fore, that get repeated more often? Well, we did in, in our methods. We asked people to first write down three dreams. And, and we talked with them about those dreams to discover, was there this consistency? Were the dreams related? Were they all on the same theme or sub-themes? Or uh, were they distinctively different? Um, they talked about the dream that was number one to them uh, in great detail. And we found that, for instance, uh, there were differences in social class as to whether or not people stayed consistently on one theme of dream or if they were what we call diverse dreamers. People who could perhaps on one hand say they were most interested in a, in a career-themed dream and then perhaps their second or their third went off to uh, family or adventure as their theme. So there were some social class dimensions as to whether or not people felt they had to stay concentrated or had the freedom to be diverse in dreaming. Karen, where, do, where does daydreaming fit into this equation, if it does at all? Well, I think it's a big part of it. I think that's what, you know, I said, it's almost as if we pick a place in our mind that we go inhabit. And I think that's uh, when most of this kind of dreaming gets done. Um, you know, I was thinking of uh, one person who told us that their dream was to learn as many languages from around the world as possible. And uh, when she would get discouraged because the particular language she was learning was not going well, she told me that she would uh, just sit down quietly or lay down quietly and think about her dream and then perhaps even put on a movie or a radio show in a foreign language and let herself daydream about being able to pick up that language and many more. So I think, you know, the daydreaming part is a large uh, uh, aspect of this when people build these dreams. And, you know, I think they do, you know, it starts out with a kernel of something. And every time they go back to that place to think about it, it gets more and more elaborate for them. And it begins to feel more and more realistic and comforting and exciting to them. And is there a sense that, that they can will something into place by the power of those dreams? You know, I think some people certainly feel that way, and I can't help but go back to that book that was such a right. be bestseller, The Secret by Rhonda Burns, um, where, you know, that was the thesis of the book, that if you really concentrate on it and think about it and get devoted to it, it's going to happen. And I think, you know, that kind of uh, is, is uh, an idea that's living out there um, in American culture, that people feel that way at one level, that if they just think about this, they can will it uh, into reality. And um, this is, you know, one of the things that we talk about toward the end of the book, that we it's important, I think, for people to understand that you can't will a dream into reality, that we need to help people learn how to plan. If they truly want to accomplish that dream, we need to help people 
learn how to plan to get that and not just assume that it's going to kind of fall out of the sky and uh, it's going to happen for them. Is that a uniquely American notion? You know, I think to some extent it is both American and Western European, but Americans tend to be among the most optimistic group in the world. Um, again, uh, you know, it, it, it waits to be discovered whether what we find in uh, non-European countries and African countries and Asian countries, we may indeed find that this kind of dreaming is just as prevalent. Uh, It's it's sort of an open question right now, but certainly Americans are right at the front of the line when it comes to this kind of thinking. But Jeff, you raise a great point in that, and it sort of foreshadows what we hope to be the next step. We'd love to be able to take our dreaming questions abroad (laughs) and see just what kind of uh, findings we get in other nations, other cultures. Are there recurring themes, recurring mythologies that show up in these dreams, Janet? Well, we we certainly documented that that despite the perception by many that dreams are wildly diverse, we found that there were basically uh, six to seven themes that basically there's dreams about adventure and careers, fame, wealth, and power, uh, family, philanthropy, uh, and self-improvement. And uh, no matter what the specifics, we were able to, uh, what, to categorize the wealth of dreams we heard about into one of those basic categories. To what extent, Karen, was success and or money a part of these dreams? You know, it was interesting. Um, When we were doing these uh, studies, we really expected to hear a lot of people say, like, they would dream of winning the lottery and (laughs) buy mansions and so forth. And almost no one, perhaps with the exception of the third and fourth graders, (laughs) almost no one mentioned that. And we were very surprised by that. And we asked the people we spoke with, haven't you ever thought about, you know, the lottery as a dream or winning a sweepstakes or something? And people told us, no, um, because I want my dream to be something I earn. I want to have my efforts behind it. I want it to feel like an accomplishment. I don't want it dropped in my lap. Uh, I want it to be something that I do, something that reflects me and what I'm capable of. So Yes, there is to some extent, you know, we had people who wanted to do startup companies or wanted to be Broadway or film stars or wanted to be the star quarterback on the on a football team. And certainly that involves fame and wealth and fortune. But it never was the kind of thing where I would just suddenly get that wealth. It's something that I would have earned. We were not absolutely surprised by the relative lack of interest in uh, upward mobility in terms of status or money. It it really was one of the more surprising findings for us. What do you attribute that to? Well, um, I think, again, people were, we we say that one of the myths of of dreaming is that the sky is the limit for people. Uh, We really found that our dreamers were pretty practical. Their, their dreams were often down to earth. They, they hoped to have uh, a, a long and happy growing old with their partners. They wanted to, to be able to take extended family vacations and have the resources to be able to do that. Now, that's some mon- money, but it's not the kind of grand fortune that you would think more people would want. So they were being uh, toned down, realistic, practical, but there is is a sense in which that's quite keeping with the American spirit. And again, that's not to say there weren't some people. You know, I I do remember a a guy in his 20s who told me he wanted to be the next Elon Musk and he could see himself on top of a big skyscraper in New York with his feet on the desk, looking out the window, a fantastic view and having lots and lots of money. But again, 
there was a sense that somehow you had to be involved in earning that position. And that's kind of, you know, the American work ethic yeah. yep. that's uh, so entrenched in uh, our culture for, our, for very uh, centuries, really. Um, so I think, you know, at, at some level that uh, was at play here as well. And, and I'd love to add here that the one category of dreamers that were the most affected and uh, where dreaming was diminished were the unemployed. It wasn't the cancer patient. It wasn't the person whose home was destroyed in a hurricane. It was the unemployed. And I think that goes speaks to Karen's point again about how important work is and earning your own in American culture. The unemployed were the folks that had really seen their, their dreaming, I'd say, capacity uh, diminished. Was there any connection between the degree to which people were partaking of or immersed in popular culture versus those that might not be in terms of how that impacted their dreams? Yeah, we, we found that almost everyone we talked to was well immersed in popular culture. It's almost unavoidable these days because of social media uh, and the amount of time people spend with social media. Um, many people spend more time on social media than they do with their own family members. And um, it's impossible then not to be soaking in these cultural lessons, be they positive or negative, but they they're, tend to be overwhelmingly positive. It's uh, impossible not to be soaking in those lessons. And so um, we didn't find a lot of variation in people's exposure to culture. What surprised you the most in, in, in digging into this? Janet, start with you. Um. I guess uh, the tenacity of dreaming that this idea that folks were never going to give up on their dreams. Even the oldest folks in our sample that no, they were never going to abandon or give up on their dreams. Um, and I'm just reminded again of, of these stories we're hearing from some of the uh, people in Ukraine. And it, it makes me hopeful that given the awful times we are living through and, and tragedy, for instance, like the one in Texas, that I hope uh, dreaming will never ever be out of the reach of individuals. Karen? A couple of things struck me. One was how early people uh, fall into the pattern of understanding what it means to dream and then committing. The difference between our third graders and fourth graders in our interviews were dramatic. And I was surprised then to see that fourth graders began to look like all of the generations above them. Uh, all of the the uh, age groups above them. So it struck me that there is this period somewhere around nine or 10 years old when you start thinking about dreams the way adults think about dreams. And uh, that was the notable for me. Um, the other thing that was notable for me was that there was a certain age group, and you know, I call them sort of, sort of early midlife uh, people who were starting families who put a pause on their dreams. And uh, I kind of expected those young parents to be um, dreaming for their children, but they were not willing to dream at all for that short period of time because they felt they had to have both feet on the ground and be dedicated to raising their children, uh, at least until their children got into school and they felt they were on a, a path. So those were two things that were kind of group specific that, um, uh, stuck in my mind. Did you find that sort of frightening on a certain level, the idea that people would ab either abandon their dreams or, or literally put them aside? Well, I found it, I don't know if I would say frightening, but I found it very surprising. As I said, I thought I was going to hear new parents talk about what they dreamed for their new ch children. And there was a sense that raising a very young child is serious business and there's no time for dreaming. So you gotta put dreaming aside for that period of time. And um, I've actually talk and, talked to parents since then, since the study, who, who said, yeah, that they agreed with that, that you know, until their children got a little bit older, they felt dreaming was a luxury. 
Janet Ruan, Karen Cerullo. The book is Dreams of a Lifetime, How Who We Are Shapes How We Imagine Our Future. Karen, Janet, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you.